Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy in the abundance of your grace and mercy, to glorify your resurrection with pure hearts, to celebrate your victory, victory with holy hymns, and to proclaim your might with pure tongues. We thank you for your love, and we worship you crying out, Christ is risen, he is truly risen. To you be glory to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the living and immortal One who gave life to his people by his cross and salvation to his church and happiness to his flock by his resurrection. When he appears, he shall give joy to his inheritance. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. We worship and praise you, O only begotten Son. You descended into the darkness of the tombs and worked wonders in the realm of the dead. By your resurrection you freed the captives, and by your voice you awakened the righteous and the just, who had gone to their rest in the sleep of death. You gathered the nations to worship you and to proclaim your salvation. They rejoice and they cry out, on Friday the King endured pain and was crucified, and today victory has been achieved by his resurrection. On Friday a lance pierced his holy side, and today in his compassion the waters of baptism flow forth. On Friday he was crowned with thorns, and today he has adorned his holy church with a crown of splendor. Today is the day of rejoicing in the resurrection. Today is the day of rejoicing for all who have gone to their rest in the hope of the resurrection. Today, with the fragrance of this incense, the church and her children celebrate and sing hymns of glory, saying, O Creator of life, you have saved us by your passion, and you have given us life by your resurrection. Now renew our image by your grace, Clothe our bodies with the power of the Spirit, so that we may shine in the robe of glory and in its light see you, the true Bridegroom. 
In your grace, make us and all the faithful departed worthy of your heavenly kingdom, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Sacrifice yourself for us, we give you thanks. O incense of forgiveness, we adore you, for you have brought us close to your Father, enriched us by your birth, purified us by your baptism, sanctified us by your crucifixion. Reconciled us to the Father by your resurrection, raised us up by your ascension, and adorned us with the gifts of your Spirit. Now, O Lord, accept our incense and fill us always with your sweet fragrance, so that our tongues may never cease in giving thanks to you forever. Amen. Kaddishat, Aloha Kaddishat,
Church is rejoicing for her shepherd truly rose. Christ, who died for his people, conquered death to give new life. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, such as my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of chains, like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I bear with everything for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, together with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we persevere, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense 
and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luca, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, Now on that very day, two of them were going to a village about seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were speaking and debating, Jesus himself drew near to them and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? And they stopped looking downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you, you, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of these things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? And they said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word before God and before all the men, and how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we had been hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. And some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. They came back, and they reported they, that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced to them that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them in reply, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was continuing on farther. But they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost spent. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and he gave it to them. And with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he then vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us, while he spoke to us along the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once, and they returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven, and those with them, and who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two, 
recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the truth, peace be with you. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which in Christ Jesus goes with eternal glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. And of course, as I told you before, these are the pastoral letters. So they're the letters that are written towards the end of St. Paul's life. So this is an old man who has now reflected and pondered and contemplated, besides receiving revelation, has meditated on these things now for almost three decades. And so in his last days, he gives a lot of practical applications to Timothy and to Titus in these three letters giving them application because now it's their turn. They're the ones who lead the churches. They're the ones who need to communicate in the next generation these realities. And St. Paul is writing them as he indicates very clearly in the reading today. He's writing from prison. He's in Rome. And he talks about his chains, I'm shackled. He's under house arrest, which means he's shackled usually to a soldier. All the time, every day. But then he says to them, to these young men who are his disciples, his his students, he says to them, but the word of God is never shackled. And so the word of God, even while he's in prison, he talks about it spreading in other parts of these letters. And he says, all of these things I put up with, I endure. I'll undergo imprisonment so that others will also be able to come to that healing, that salvation, which comes with the word which comes with the hearing and that healing and salvation in Christ Jesus. And along with that, definitively, beyond the veil, eternal glory. So yes, chains, I'll put up with chains. Headaches, put up with it. Difficulties, yes. Misunderstandings, yes. Difficulties, yes. Everything. Because the word of God will never be imprisoned. So why should I only be complaining and worrying about myself? This is the beauty of this old man who now, in contemplating this reality for decades, gives this encouragement to the next generation. And that's the way it should always be. So we've spoken to you on the idea that what we want to do today is to stand in a certain admiration of the providence of God. Because remember, we're considering about New Sunday, This idea of time being renewed, of generation after generation, of time itself being transformed by the resurrection of our Lord. So we told you last week on New Sunday that we're going to take a bit of a pause now and talk about what is the Sunday and why is it a central reality and the oldest reality that we have in Catholicism. It is from the very beginning. It is spoken of in the Apocalypse, the Kyriake, the Lord's day. And then also the aspect of that time and grace of transcendence. Notice the hymn that St. Paul quotes today. If we live with him, we'll endure with him. If we die with him, we will live and suffer with him. This is actually a hymn that he's quoting. And this idea that our sufferings are not our sufferings. Our sufferings By our baptism and by the faith, our sufferings are those which are endured within our Lord and therefore within his sufferings. And his sufferings, of course, finish with resurrection. 
And that triumph has to always be part of our understanding of past, present, and future. Because even to St. Paul, when he's writing to Timothy about these things, the resurrection of our Lord had taken place decades before. And so in that reality, it's past. And yet the reality of that death and resurrection is still present to St. Paul, as it is still present to us. And he links it, of course, with that healing, that salvation now goes along with, he says, eternal glory, the future. It's a past, present, and future. So the new Sunday, as we mentioned, deals with the Sunday. But a lot of us never really think about the fact is, well, where did we ever get a seven-day week? For most of the history of the world, people governed it by the sunrise and sunset, quite logically, and by the moon. So you normally broke up everything in like what we would now call kind of two-week blocks because the moon goes through phases and they're roughly breaking up into what we have of two weeks solar. So where do we get a seven day week? It's spoken of, of course, in the Old Testament. So we know that in the book of Genesis, we know that it's a reality for the people of Israel. But the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, the Indians, they're not, they're not Jews. So where does the seven day week even come from? So that then the Lord God will take that first day of the week, the day of the sun, and transform it into a sacramental reality of that past, present, and future of grace, which is the healing of the gospel. So that's what I meant by let us admire the providence of God at this point. The seven-day seven week is planetary. Beginning with the sun, they're all after different planets because in the classical world, those are the things you could see with your naked eye were seven planets. Of course, when you were children, there were nine, and now there's only eight. So it just depends on how you count them. But seven you could see. And this begins in Mesopotamia. What's now, we have evidence of, well, it's in now what's southern Iraq. We have evidence of a king who lived, his name was Gudea, it doesn't matter. But we have evidence of this seven-day measurement of time according to the seven planets that they could see. These are the Magi. This is their religion. This is what we now call Zoroastrianism. And Gudea is a contemporary roughly with Abraham. So this is about 2000 BC. Gudea certainly didn't know Abraham. Abraham certainly didn't know Gudea. But they're roughly the period of time in which these pagan peoples are setting up a measurement of a time in seven. It may or may not have an influence culturally with the Hebrews. But what is fascinating about this is a God, because he is the God of all the peoples of the earth, of all of creation. This seven-day week, which is going to be the sacramental reality that we call New Sunday, begins among pagan peoples and is going to spread out from the Middle East throughout the entire world, except Africa. But of all of the Eurasian continent, it spreads everywhere over the next 2,000 years because the Magi are smart and people admire Mesopotamia for its learning. I mean, nowadays we've blown it apart. So you think of it as a pile of rubber, rubble where everyone's blowing each other up all the time. And sadly, that's true at present. But that is not its history. It's history. And when Christianity came to it in the very beginning, it was an urbanized culture, cosmopolitan civilization that was the center of the world. And so the Magi who come to our Lord's crib when he's born, St. Matthew wants to point that out because these people, the smart ones, they know the Messiah is here and the Christ is born. That's why they come to Bethlehem. But for the same reason on a cultural level, the Hellenized versions of the Magi, because of course, Alexander the Great conquers the whole thing in the third century BC. So 1700 years after 
our evidence of the seven-day week. But this keeps spreading, and from the Middle East, it goes to India, it goes through India to China, and it winds up coming into the whole Greece and into the classical world that we know as the Roman Empire. And why I say we stand in admiration of God's providence is because it enters the Roman Empire in the time of Augustus. In other words, this seven manner of seven day week of counting, which is clearly we know from the Old Testament, the pagans aren't Jews. And yet God will take this seven day week and brings it to the empire by history. So that in the first century at the same time of our Lord's death and resurrection, that becomes the manner in which the Romans begin to start counting. And because the Jews are like everywhere in all the major cities, merchandising usually, they're business people, then the Romans actually in those first 300 years of Christianity begin to start doing something rather strange. Because in the beginning, the Romans, don't, the Romans don't have a week. They have months, and then they have periodic holidays, like we're returning to. We're returning to that pagan notion of just the month, and then there'll be certain bank holidays. In fact, Britain already just calls them bank holidays. They basically take a day or two each month and just have a day off. Because weekends, what's a weekend? You go shopping. That's when you're waxing the floor, you do your laundry, you paint the garage. There is no holy day any longer. We're returning back to the way the pagans used to think. You just have a block of 30 days, a block of 30 days, a block of 30 days, we just go through this. And so, and that is certainly has an aspect because of the gospel, has a demonic aspect to it. But that's a whole nother sermon. But this way of just simply counting, for the Romans, they just had 30 day blocks which is why the Romans actually used to make fun of the Jews, because they thought they were bums. Because every seventh day, they didn't do anything, because it was Shabbat, it was the day of rest. And so in the Sabbath, that day of rest, the Romans just saw them as being lazy. And surely they will accuse Catholics of being lazy in the future, because on Sunday, you have the day of rest. But that's another sermon. So what is fascinating to watch is how God's providence takes a pagan concept from 2,000 years before our Lord, has it brought into the Roman Empire at exactly the same time of his son's incarnation, and then over the next three centuries makes it the way that the pagans count their time. Now for them, it's planets. For the Jews, the day of Saturn, Saturday, the day of Saturn. What the Romans started doing is because of this Jewish influence is that a lot of the, a lot of the pagans started taking Saturday as a day of rest. In the beginning, they were calling them lazy. And then after you thought, well, that's actually kind of nice to take a break every seven days. So that by the time you arrive at Constantine in the early 300s, you now have the Roman Empire, the educated people, this Roman Empire, who many of them were taking a Saturday day of rest. So when Tertullian in the 100s is writing, he can write about the fact of you're taking a day of writing to the pagans. You take a day of rest on the day of Saturn. But the day that you should be doing it is the day of the sun. And so it is a magnificent thing to watch that over a 2,000 year period, how God moves. And that's why for the Maronite tradition, the Sunday after the resurrection is New Sunday. It emphasizes this transformation of time. And so when Constantine in the year 321, all right, so you do the math, exactly 1,700 years ago this year, Forget about the bicentennial. 1,700 years ago this year, Constantine made Sunday, the day of the sun, a day of rest, legally, officially, for the first time in the history of the world and certainly the history, well, the history of the empire for sure, and the history of the world. So why could he pull that off? So in other words, the Sunday that you've all watched disappear during your lifetime, 
It has been around as the standard for almost two millennia. And now it's being uprooted. And the Sunday has great importance. So why could Constantine do this? Well, because by the time you arrive at the early 300s, many of the Romans, while they were still pagan, polytheistic, many of them worshipped primarily and sometimes exclusively the sun. Constantine himself was a worshiper of the sun. His father was a worshiper of the sun. I mean, Constantine, at the end of his life, yes, he converts. And of course, his mom is very holy, St. Helen. But Constantine is coming from a family tradition of worshiping the sun. He could make the day of the sun, the first day of the week, a legal day in which all the courts will be closed, all the theaters will be closed, the, the workplaces, these will all be shut down for a day of rest because even the pagan population worshiped the sun. That's how he was able to pull off that bipartisan coup of making a political decision and legislation. Because at that point, about the population of the Roman Empire is probably eight or 10% of the entire empire were Christians. So he wasn't doing it exclusively for the Christians, but he could do it for the Christians, and for the sake of mom, he could do it and do it politically well with no problem because many, many, many of the pagans worship the sun. So 1,700 years ago, that's what took place this year. And this was done as a transformation. And once that was done in 321, you just pulled out those blocks and the jet took off. The conversions that began to take place during the 300s were so enormous that they didn't have capacity to receive everybody into the church. If you go to Geneva, we'll finish with this last little detail. If you go to Geneva, the, the cathedral which is there, and sadly it's Calvinist, of course, but it was built as a Catholic cathedral, of course, because there's only Catholicism, that's Christianity. And it was built in the 13th century. But you can go to excavations under this to find the 10th century church that was built by the Burgundians. And then you can go into excavations which go below that 10th century church, built essentially a century after Charlemagne, and you can go to the bottom of the excavations and you can find the remains, archeological remains, of the cathedral from the third century. So now we're talking about late 200s, early 300s, the same time in which Constantine did these things with time in a seven-day week. But what is fascinating about this site, it's a good-sized church, and Christianity has probably been there since the second century, so it's probably been 100 years that Catholicism has already, in the late 200s, already been in Geneva. But what is fascinating is in that fourth century, in those 300s, there is another church built, essentially the same size, but doesn't have any altar in it. And it seems that what they had to do is because the church became too small in the 300s, they had to build an entire duplicate next to it just to use as an auditorium. Just simply because there's a walkway that goes out into the middle that surely the catechist would stand in the middle of a crowd all around this building and catechize them. The baptistry was in between these two churches. So you would be catechized in one and eventually through your baptism be moved to the second one. And that's why by the 10th century, it's like this isn't working at all. They're building it bigger, they do remodeling, and then finally they just simply level the whole thing and build a whole new one. It is a fascinating history to be able to see this continuity. And as Catholics, you must never forget the continuity that links us generation generation back to St. Paul writing this letter, that I may be chained, but the word of God is never shackled. You must have that vision of life and vitality, and it centers around the observance of the Kyriake, the Lord's Day. So we finish with St. Paul's quotation of this hymn. So this saying is sure, if we have died with him, 
we shall also live with him. If we endure, if we persevere, if we put up with, if we sustain, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, we drop the ball, the baton gets dropped on the ground, there's no relay. But if we are faithless, he remains always faithful because he cannot deny himself. He is substantial reality of truth. He is substantial truthfulness and that he can't deny. And that is the touch of what Sunday is. And that continues next week of the Kyriake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. sheets for the transfer him of the resurrection in your pews.
Almighty Lord, in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings which your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saints Mary and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of the Twelve Apostles on page 754. 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar 
with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory to thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim, who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. <laughs> And holy is your life-giving Spirit. You are holy and the giver of all that is good. For our salvation, your only begotten Son became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary. And by his divine plan, he saved and redeemed us. Kyrie eleison. Wabiyamu haudaktum hashodile mabed Ansame lachma mida kodi shanto u barach ku kodesh Waksu ya bel talmida kodo mara Sabachu la mehne kuluchun Khuno denita Fakhro hodil Dachlo faikun wachlov sagiyem Metapaseo meti heb, who soon yon, how may wa ho ye dan alam alamin. Ho kanga alukoso domsik woman hamro woman mahayo. Ya del talmi dao karo mara Sabishta wa mehne kulukhu Ho no deni tao Demo dila diya tiki khadato Dakhlo faikun wakhlof sagiyem Ete shadu me tiheb Khusunyon khawme wa khayidan alam alameen Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup You do so in memory of me until I come again Salvation, 
And we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences, so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather, make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Ashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith. With blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have, pre who have presented these offerings. Forgive them, so that they, may live, they always, that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. You are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen, the archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, and all of the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. <coughs> 
Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy, pray with purity and holiness, and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom be come, thy will be done. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways, and do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you, deliver us from all harm, and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord. He is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy blood, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our community be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. <laughs>
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you, for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit now and forever. <clears throat> Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, 
You became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.